All right, folks, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to psychology and what it is, and then we're going to talk about descriptive research methods. So the first thing we are going to talk about is our good old definition of psychology. Um, if I ask you, what do you think of when you think of psychology? I'm going to take a second to think about that. When I ask that in a classroom setting, many students say, well, it has something to do with behavior, and some folks usually add, well, it has something to do with um, what's happening in your head, your emotions, and your thinking. And they are both correct. It is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. We are going to break this definition down on the next couple of slides, and we're going to start by looking at behavior. So, behavior is what you do. It's observable. You can see it happening in front of you. Imagine that I came into a, a classroom where you were sitting and I kind of stomped down the hallway and I kind of huffed and puffed <sighs> as I went along and when I got to the front of the room my brows were knitted together as if I were angry and I the way I talked was kind of curt and brief and I said okay today we're going to talk about psychology. That would be my behavior, what you observe. Then that's the nice thing about behavior is that you can observe it. Mental processes are a little bit different. Can we directly observe your thinking? Well, some people may say, well, you know, there's brain scans that can look at brain activity, the glucose consumption, for example, or oxygen consumption in the brain, um, in other words, brain activity. But what we can't do is we can't know exactly what you're thinking. Thank goodness. We can, however, infer about what a person is um, thinking and what they're feeling by looking at their behavior. And we do this all of the time. We make inferences about people when we see them, like your teacher coming into the classroom and appearing like they're upset. You will start to think, oh, well, she looks upset. Maybe she's angry. And then we'll even do things like go so far as to, to guess why. Hmm, I wonder if she got in a fight with her husband this morning. I wonder if something's happening at work. So we will try to figure it out. We just kind of can't help ourselves. Um, but again, mental processes are inferred. They're not directly observable. The next piece of our definition is this scientific method piece, which is the beginning of the definition, um, that we have a scientific study in psychology. All sciences follow the scientific method. And so this method is a particular way we go about gaining knowledge and expanding our knowledge in a particular field. So you've seen this before in your other classes. Um, your book has a certain set of steps. Other textbooks may break the steps further down and have more of them or they may group certain steps together. But the basic idea is that you have some sort of question you create a hypothesis about that question. You select a research method and design um, to kind of look at that question. You collect the data. After you get the data, whatever it is, however you collect it, you draw conclusions about that. Certain types of research allow us to make certain types of conclusions. Um, and then you publish that information. And then it goes back into this wheel again, where you kind of have a question, you create that hypothesis, you, you design a study, you collect the data, you draw the conclusions, and you publish it again. It's always important to publish the information, the findings. Kind of ironically, we publish findings that are exciting, like, hey, we tested this and we found something. This is wonderful. But we tend to not publish things that are not successful. In other words, we don't find something exciting in them. It's rather unfortunate because since we don't publish that stuff regularly, then a lot of people go around kind of reinventing the wheel um, on our non-successes. 
So the idea with the scientific method is to have kind of a consistent way to, to examine things and, um, and kind of guide us to, to discover new knowledge. Sometimes, by the way, people say, oh, well, psychology is not really a science. It's not a hard science. And I'm just going to point out to you what that, where that comes from. Um, some disciplines, like chemistry, for example, you can do a lot of experiments, which is kind of the golden standard of, uh, of research, because you can control all these variables and then you can change something and see what happens. Um, in psychology, it's more difficult. It's sometimes called a soft science, which implies that it's not really as strong of a science but that is not the case. We are still a strong science. It's just that our subject matter is a little more challenging. There's a lot of things that we um, can't do in psychology because of ethical concerns. And so that's where that comes from, that idea that it's kind of a soft science as opposed to a hard science. Because of our subject matter, studying people and other animals, um, we, we have to be careful what we do. We can't um, do things that would hurt them, for example. So let's move on to research methods. We're going to look at just the descriptive category. You see three categories here, descriptive, correlational, and experimental. We are just going to cover the descriptive methods here. So there are three categories plus really a fourth, which um, can be added in, it kind of combines the previous three. So this is a wonderful name they use here. Sometimes in psychology we use names that make sense. So what are you doing in this kind of research? You're describing behavior and there are a variety of ways to do that. The first way is through observation. So in observation, again another great term, you observe the behavior happening and you write it down. This can happen in a natural setting, like um, if you were observing the wild panda, you could be out in the forest, in the natural environment, lurking around the bamboo, trying not to be seen by the panda, so the panda didn't change his or her behavior, and you're kind of recording whatever that panda is doing. You could also do this with humans too. Um, let's say I was interested in uh, studying aggression on the playground and I'm behind kind of a window where the children can't see in and I'm observing and writing down their behavior. That would be naturalistic observation. Laboratory observation would take place in a lab. And so that means you would come to the place where the researcher's at and you would participate or you could, for example, they might come into your workplace and do a study there. The key with laboratory observation is that they are controlling the situation. And so it's not natural. It's um, somewhat contrived. They may, for instance, be interested in leadership. And so they may have you come into the lab and sit down and you start uh, working with a group of people on some kind of task and all the while they're observing what emerges in terms of leadership. So the advantage of naturalistic observation is it's natural. The disadvantage is that it's natural. In other words, you don't have control over the situation. Let's say you want to observe aggression in those pandas and you have to follow that panda around for months and months before you see any aggressive behavior. And then when you do, it's not going to be the same as aggressive behavior later um, because it's a different situation every time. So laboratory uh, observation is, has the benefit of having a lot of control but the disadvantage of it not being natural and the behavior may not be natural. The second category is the case study. The case study is where you look at just one particular case. Now this is commonly done when there's something unusual. So for instance, imagine that someone has a particular kind of brain injury. They've injured a particular spot in the brain and their behaviors changed because of that. 
what a researcher would do in this case is learn everything they possibly can about this person before and after the accident. They would talk to the individual, they would talk to their family, they would talk to their workplace, they would learn everything they could to see how had this person changed since this injury. You might also see it in places um, where there's an unusual kind of disorder, maybe a disorder that hadn't yet been identified. For example, um, th there was an early case of what used to be called multiple personality disorder, which is now called dissociative identity disorder. And one of those early cases was the case of Sybil. And they hadn't yet talked about this as being a potential disorder. And so when they started to notice that this individual had some unusual tendencies, they started to investigate her and talk to her family and get as much information as they could. And over time, they had enough case studies on different folks that they were able to say, hey, this is actually um, a disorder. It's unusual, but it is an actual disorder. So case studies are used to learn a lot about an individual, um, maybe collect information uh, for commonalities between similar kinds of things. Uh, the advantage, you get a lot of information on one person, uh, the disadvantage, you only get a lot of information on one person. In other words, that can't be generalized out to a larger or broader population of people. The third category is the survey or interview. So this is another way to learn about behavior. Um, surveys can be done by interview or they can be done paper and pencil. That's usually the most common form because it's quick and it's inexpensive and you can do it with a lot of people. You can do a survey on many, many people very quickly. Interviews, they take a little bit longer. They can be very extensive as well, um, but it depends on what you're asking during the interview process. So surveys have the advantage of being cheap and inexpensive interviews eh, they can be much more expensive the problem with both of these is that people may potentially lie so you have to be very cautious how you phrase your questions um, because the way you ask a question or the way an interview the tone of voice they use uh, the way it's phrased, the way they look at you when they ask you, may suggest um, a certain type of response is desired. And so that can be a disadvantage of these. You have to be very cautious about that. The, this is an extra category. I kind of throw it in here because it's interesting. It combines kind of the previous three into one um, way of exploring behavior. And this is called ethnographic research. And ethnographic research combines observational techniques, case study technique, and also survey and interview techniques into kind of one thing. And so with an ethnography, what, what the person's doing is they're going to a, usually a culture different from their own. They're trying to learn all about that particular culture, all about these people, that they don't know much about. And they're doing it by watching and recording, by interviewing individuals and families, by doing surveys and all sorts of things. And in the end, they will produce a, a document called an ethnography. And the ethnography is kind of a compilation of all their findings, what they've learned. And in the image here, you see a picture of Margaret Mead. Uh, she was a famous cultural anthropologist, and she went to a variety of places uh, in the South Pacific and, and others as well, and studied uh, kind of individual groups of people. And she reported those um, as, as ethnographies. So I think this gives you a good start thinking about these descriptive methods. Um, again, the next category is the correlational category, and the third category is the experimental category. Um, here are some review questions that you may find helpful. See if you can answer these now. 